it's going to be a whistle stop tour of pitching and presentation skills. Now, the one thing that you must not do is tell us at the end everything that we got wrong. So <laughs> we're going to tell you how to pitch and present. And then at the end, you're going to sit there and say, but they didn't do that. They didn't follow their own advice. And that's probably very true because we don't get all of these things right all of the time. And that is the reality. There is best practice when it comes to pitching and presentation skills, but we don't always operate in a world of best practice. So don't, don't stress if when you're pitching or presenting, it doesn't all go according to plan because that's real life. And we're all human beings and we accept that actually we're fallible. And even when you watch those TED Talks and you watch those videos online, they've been rehearsed over and over and over again. So some of those presentations, they have spent nine months learning that 18 minute presentation. They have been practicing it every single week for nine months. Very rarely are you gonna get the opportunity to spend quite that long practicing a pitch or a presentation. So take all of this as best practice, take it all as things to go away and think about. But if you don't get all of it every time, you don't get it right every time, that's okay. Because actually we're all here to have a conversation. And the best pictures and presentations are the ones where people feel involved. And that's what we're gonna go on and share with you. So I'm not sharing my screen at the moment, I will do in a second. But the first thing I wanted to ask is what is a pitch? Anyone want to be brave enough to come and shout about what is a pitch? As in, in comparing it to a presentation, Lee, they did the sort of contrast. Well, um, a presentation, I would say, is more to um, inform in information, not necessarily to have an end goal, where to pitch or sort of persuading someone to perhaps buy a product of yours or um, your event to pitch an idea. Um, so that's the main between but there's a lot of overlap between the two at the same time yeah perfect so there is a lot of overlap between them we use the language interchangeably as well so when you are asked to prepare a pitch sometimes it's a presentation and sometimes it's a pitch when you're being asked to prepare a presentation actually sometimes what they're looking for is a pitch so particularly if an organization says to you please come and present to us and tell us how you can help us they're not looking for a presentation of information they're looking for a pitch where you're telling a story and what you can do for them but internally you might be sharing information you might have a monthly board meeting where you have to report on data and statistics and that's information sharing so that's a presentation Ooh, I'm echoing somewhere, but that's that's a kind of artificial distinction that we have between pitching and presentations. Um, pitching is all about that call to action. How do we get people to engage? How do we get them to do what we want them to? Whereas presentations tend to be more about information sharing, information gathering and sharing that data. So let me, there we go. Try not to share. Try not to put you on top of the slides on my screen because I want to be able to see you. There we go. So what is a pitch? A pitch is a way of getting resources. When we want something, we pitch. When we are in demand for something. So that could be that we are pitching internally for additional headcount. And I'm sure many of us have done that when we've needed more staff um, to get things done. We might be pitching for different resources. So within our organisations, there might be people that we need to be seconded to come and work with us. We might need additional budget. We might need investment in new tools or technologies or platforms. So we pitch internally. We might also be seeking investment. So we might want somebody to invest in a business idea and that could be a startup or it could be something that we're looking to spin out from our existing organization. We might be looking for crowdfunding. We might be looking for seed funding. We might be looking for any, any sort of investment within our organization to get it moving. We might be part of a group. So our business, our company within that bigger group needs investment from head office 
to be able to develop. And a pitch is a way of selling to our customers. So we pitch to our customers as well. We pitch to say, buy our product, buy our thing, buy our service. So we pitch when we're trying to get resources, we pitch when we want investment, we pitch when we're trying to sell what we're doing. And you were absolutely right, Ben, when we were talking about the difference between a pitch and a presentation, then quite often those presentations are more about the facts. We're looking at that logical, rational approach. Whereas with a pitch, yes, we still want evidence, we still need something to back up what we're saying, but we're trying to tap more into the emotional element of the people that we're engaging with. So whether it is our bosses, whether it's our colleagues, whether it's investors, whether it's customers, we want them to emotionally engage with us because there's a reason then for that connection. When we're presenting, we're demonstrating, we're introducing, we're, we are sharing ideas, but it is very much about handing over, here is the thing that we want you to know. Whereas with a pitch, we want people to take an action afterwards. Now that action could be that we have transformed their way of thinking about something. So they've gone away with a big idea and they're gonna behave differently. We have pitched the idea that people should be recycling and therefore they go away and they fully believe that they should be recycling going forwards. Whereas we might present the data on recycling rates in a particular region. So they are interchangeable. We do use them interchangeably, but it's worth thinking about what is it when we're trying to put something forward, are we pitching or are we presenting? Because there are some subtly different ways in which we can approach those. We want energy. So the reason that I'm trying to be energetic is because great pitches create energy and it's difficult when it's hot and it's difficult if you've been working all day. And if you are fed up because you've been talking about the same subject matter for the last three years and you've finally got the opportunity to pitch it to the board, even though you should have pitched it three years ago. But you've got to have that energy in the room. You engage in that conversation, that dialogue. You are bringing your audience into that experience with you. And the best pitches are the ones that use storytelling. They're the ones that create an atmosphere, the ones where you feel immersed within that experience. And they are clear, they are concise, they are focused. So we make an impact when we pitch. We want people to remember us when we pitch to them. So we will come back to this idea of energy and experience around pitches. But before we do, um, I'm not going to play the video. So we were just saying before we joined the call, a 45 minute session, we're not going to play the videos to you, but you will get the slides afterwards and then you can go away and watch them. So this is Chris Anderson and Chris is the curator for TED. And TED, if you haven't come across it, is a speaker platform for sharing great ideas. So it's been around for um, coming up 20 years now and huge amount of content. TED is the big platform and then TEDx is the regionalized and localized franchise events that take place. So there is a TEDx Aston, for example, Aston University runs a TEDx event with speakers from the region. Now what Chris says in this is that there is a stereotype that a TED -a talk is all about sitting in the middle of a red carpet and pontificating, thinking, looking cerebral telling a horrible childhood story and then coming up with some grand vision of how you're going to take things forward. But that's quite cliche, that's quite Machiavellian, manipulative, you're playing on people's emotions. And actually distilling this seven minute video down, what you get from it is the secret to any great public speaking, any great presentation or pitch is one idea. So what do we do when we try and present? We try and present everything. We try and get as much information as possible into the 15 minute time slot that we've been allocated. When we're pitching, we're trying to tell the entire story of a business startup and what it's gonna do. 
And yet the reality is that the best presentations or pitches boil down to one idea. Now, there may be elements that come off that, but it's one crystal, simple, clear idea that you can take away from that experience. So if you take nothing else from today's session, then that one idea is the most important thing to walk away with. So every time you're pitching, every time you're presenting, what is the one idea that you want people to walk away remembering? Okay, Yasmin, over to you. Yeah, um, building on what Amy said, um, not on the last slide, but the slide before that about what makes a pitch or presentation memorable um, and what will enable people to remember uh, you as a person perhaps not just the content that you've delivered um, and it goes along with the old saying of um, people won't necessarily remember what you said but they'll remember how you made them feel so a presentation that is engaging that um, brings the audience into what you're trying to say and what you're trying to pitch is is really really crucial um, and I know we'll come back to that when we touch on the five e's and how you can do things uh, with techniques such as storytelling um, and bringing people into that experience. Now ultimately um, there are some key elements that are really important when it comes to doing any kind of presentation so clarity authenticity but also being concise um, I've got a little story that is linked to these slides here. So some of the slides that we're using have come from uh, different sources, including some of our colleagues who've previously presented on um, presentation skills with our students. Um, and one of our colleagues would really drive this point home with our students about you should have no more than three bullet points on a slide, always three maximum, because you don't want to overwhelm people by uh, death by PowerPoint. So the students would be really kind of um, engaged with that, like, yeah, we, we need to focus on what we're saying and, and less so on the slides. So then when this colleague, every time he presented uh, another session where he had more than three bullet points, the students would be sat there WhatsApping each other going, oh, I can't believe Simon's got more than three bullet points this time. So practicing what you preach is also really, really key. Appealing to your audience. So again, we are going to delve a little bit more into storytelling, but in the example that I've, I've just shown on the last slide is bringing some of those relatable elements in and telling stories around what you're presenting aids in that concept around memorability um, and again can engage your audience and relate to your audience because they may have similar stories, they may want to share similar stories and um, that can also add to the overall learning from that experience for everyone involved in the presentation or pitch. It also helps reinforce key messages and again uh, links to the point Amy made about what is the one thing uh, that person or those people in the audience will take away. And if it is linked to a story or an anecdote, they may be even more likely to retell it to somebody else, which again, aids that memorability element of it. Um, and finding your own style. So I think there's probably not much value in trying to mimic the style of somebody else. So while it is useful looking at some of these TED Talks, for example, um, you may find some speakers more engaging than others. You may prefer the style of some speakers than others, but because everyone's unique and everyone's different, the temptation there is to try and mim mimic somebody else and go, oh, I'd really like to present like this person. Um, but there is also an element of authenticity and being yourself and thinking about what makes you you what is your style what gives your presentation um the uh, i guess your kind of own um piece to it um seeking acceptance or action this is probably a bit more related to pitching because you may expect there to be an outcome um, or a call to action perhaps for your audience. You may want them to do something as a result of your presentation or perhaps either agree or disagree with what you're saying and ultimately still be engaged with the content that you're delivering. Okay, so we've said it already. What is the magic number? Any volunteers? 
three. Three, three, yeah, three people holding three fingers up. Three is the magic number. When it comes to presenting, this is what we're looking for. So one big idea and three ways in which we tell that. So we have a beginning and a middle and an end. Whenever we tell a story, we have the start point, we have the end point, and then something happens to get us between them. And you will have heard probably from a sales perspective, tell them what you're gonna tell them, then tell them the thing, and then tell them what you told them. So we're still relying on this one big idea, but we're doing it in three stages. So what are we gonna tell them? What is the context? We are gonna tell you all about pitching and presentation skills. Now, guess what? We didn't do that on this one because there's an air of mystery and sometimes you can shake it up a bit. But tell them what you're gonna tell them. Why should they listen? Well, you should listen to us because you will be a better presenter at the end of this session. You will have tips and tricks that will ensure that you are more confident when it comes to speaking on camera and face to face. Tell them how they're going to do it. So this is the content. This is the, the stuff that we're sharing with you in terms of those tips and tricks. Now, there may be a conflict. So if we are trying to um, pitch a business solution and we're trying to get some investment, then we might say we're looking for half a million pound investment for this piece of technology that is going to enable us to automate these systems. The reason that we want this technology to automate these systems is because currently it's costing us time and money. Our people are demotivated, they're overworked, and this technology will streamline things and enable us to be much more productive. And we've told you the reasons why, we've told you what we need, so the solution is this piece of technology, please can we have the half a million pounds? Now, it's not quite that easy to generate half a million pound investment, but that's the sort of process that you follow. So you have your beginning, your middle and your end. And that's the power of three. Now, we often use PowerPoint slides and we're doing it today. And I hate death by PowerPoint. And I am so sorry that we're doing it to you. But this is the world of virtual presentations. And this is what it's come to. There is on here, and you can watch this um, at your leisure, a link to quite an old video now about how not to do PowerPoint. And there's some really funny stuff in there around font sizes. And I hope none of you use the whizzy fonts now where they scroll in and scroll back out again and completely unreadable. If nothing else, think about accessibility for your audience. So even if you want something to be shiny and exciting, there's a reason that PowerPoint has created all of these graphics and animations and options, and that's to enable you to do lots of fun stuff with it. But there's also a reason that the head of the PowerPoint division in Microsoft has a specialist who creates all of his slide decks for him. And that specialist, her only job is to sit there and create the best quality slide decks within Microsoft. And they don't include animations and whizzy fonts and all of this other stuff. So think simple, think clarity. We do not want to have death by PowerPoint. And there is a benefit when we're online. So I've got two screens, which means that I can see all of your faces and I can be looking at you on one screen. So it's not death by PowerPoint for me because the PowerPoint is over on the other screen. But I am fully aware that for many of you, you've got one screen. And therefore, you have the pleasure of not being able to see my face, which is a good thing. But you do have a full screen of PowerPoint slide. And that can be quite tedious to just keep staring at it. So I do appreciate the irony. There used to be a rule as well that it was one slide per minute of presentation. Now, that's changed. So the one slide per minute was to stop things going too quickly, to stop having these kind of 300 slide decks. The rule now is try and ditch the words, but you can have as many slides as you want. So because you're using images to tell the story, and we're not doing that particularly well today, but if you have full, full slide images with no words, you don't need to leave the slides on the screen long enough for people to be able to read the words. What you can do is create that story and take people on that journey through the power of visuals without it becoming death by PowerPoint. You can even turn that into a video 
if you are feeling particularly tech savvy and you can talk over that video. So if you know what you're going to say, if you've rehearsed what you're going to say and you know what the timings are, you can create that experience where the video is running behind you and you are the soundtrack to that video. And we did have a student in one of our sessions who I was incredibly impressed with. So we'd set them a challenge and you are getting away with not doing the challenge today because this is a short session, otherwise you would be doing it. But we had set them the challenge of coming up with a pitch for an app to solve a real world problem. And they had 25 minutes to go away and come up with the solution and then they had to pitch it back to us. And in that 25 minutes, that student managed to collect together and edit a video that his colleagues could do the voiceover for. And at no point had they rehearsed it, but because the colleagues had said, this is how long this section takes, it was absolutely spot on that every time they changed their tone, every time they mentioned something specific, the music changed and the visuals changed. And it was really impressive. However, his experience is in the events industry and video editing. So I'm not expecting everybody to have that skill set. And I certainly wouldn't be able to do that in that quick space of time. But it does show what's possible that we can think about going beyond PowerPoint. Yasmin, do you want to do this one? Yeah, I think practice definitely makes perfect. But I also think that there is such a thing as over rehearsing where when you then even present back, it sounds like as though you're reading. So I think rehearse, but I think trying to rehearse without a script is really important. So having your key points, knowing what you want to cover, what that main idea or that main takeaway is, having your structure ready, um, but avoid full scripting, I would say, because then as you read it out in rehearsal, you are essentially memorizing lines rather than uh, practicing with your own style, your own flow and pace based on the ideas that you have. So by that method, your rehearsal is going to be different every time and your final presentation will be different, but the actual key points will be there and the takeaways will be there. Um, if you must have notes, ideally keep them brief or don't use them at all, but equally don't rely on slides. I have seen some awful presentations where people have had lengthy slides and then when you're in an actual physical room, they kind of turn and look at the slides so they can see what they need to say. So they're talking at the screen and as you can see, it's completely unengaging because my back is turned to you. Um, and, and you probably can't even hear exactly what I'm saying because my voice would just be going into the wall rather than into the audience. Um, but I've seen that a lot, so it does happen. Um, so I think the other thing to say as well is the audience isn't there to catch people out. They're not waiting for presenters to make a mistake or to mess up. So even if you do mess up, it doesn't matter. Just move on, just carry on. It's really not a big deal. Um, so yes, I think recording yourself is, is definitely something that can help with things like um, if you're umming and eyeing a lot, so um, checking how you begin your sentences, is it clear, are you mumbling, or um, yeah, as I say, kind of umming and eyeing quite a lot, but again, a little bit is okay, because again, it adds that authenticity of this is like a conversation or like dialogue rather than a rehearsal, and um, so it's that balance, I think, for sure, so that recording or having someone sit with you as you rehearse and provide feedback can be really beneficial. But don't overthink it, so the number of yeah. times now, because Yasmin and I obviously we present quite a lot with our students a lot of that content gets recorded and whenever I watch it back I notice that I start every section or every slide with either right or okay which sounds <laughs> horrendous when you listen back to I've it. I've never and noticed I, that Amy. So. No no so the person listening doesn't necessarily notice but I am now super conscious about it so rehearsing is good listening back to your recordings can tell you about the things that you do some things you may consciously want to change some things you might accept and say that's who i am mm -hmm. and in terms of the ums and ahs there is a word in the spanish language pues which is what gets used when you are umming and ahhing so the fact that these words exist in the language means that they exist for a reason it's not just a sound we make because we don't know what we're talking about it's a thinking pause yeah 
and pues is a thinking pause in Spanish, um is a thinking pause in English, and in many other languages around the world that verbal thinking pause exists and it exists to allow us to put our thoughts together so that when we speak we've got something that makes hopefully a little bit more sense. We also need to think about body language and gestures. So that's much, much harder on a camera because you can only see my head, but I am quite a gestury person. Um, when I am physically presenting, I walk around a lot. So there is an argument between whether you move or whether you're static. Who's come across the power pose? That horrendous thing that politicians do in photo shoots. We've all seen the power pose and then we've got the holding the hands together that we do in front of ourselves. Again this comes down to what is authentically you. So too much movement can be distracting, too much gesturing. So there is a gesture box which runs from kind of about here chin level, goes down the side of your body and then cuts off at about waist level. So that if you imagine a box that goes from your chin around your torso and down to your waist, that is your gesture box. And if you're gesturing within that box, then you are showing passion, you're showing that you are committed to what you're saying, you're enthusiastic. If you're gesturing outside of that box, then why should I trust you? Because you're a, a strange person who doesn't know what you're talking about. So yes, we can do some quite flamboyant gestures and that's absolutely fine when it's our personality and we're presenting, but we need to think about how does that come across to the audience. So within that gesture box tends to be quite a safe space. The occasional foray out of that gesture box is fine. Spending all of your time with your hands everywhere and your feet moving around and fidgeting, that's gonna distract from what you're saying. So think about that body language. Think about how you come across as credible and authentic. And planting your feet as well. So when we stand up and present, which is what a lot of us used to be used to doing. So in pre-COVID times, we would stand up at the front of the room and we would present to our colleagues or we would present to investors. You plant your feet, you position yourself and you present. We're all sitting in these awful chairs at home now, or even if we're back in the office, some of the chairs are horrendous, or we might be on garden furniture or sat on a bed. And that doesn't inspire us to put across that credible, confident persona. So if we plant our feet flat on the floor, that at least gives us some sort of grounding that we can work with. If we try and sit up straight, and I'm awful for this, I slouch my way through, but if we sit up straight, then we will come across as more confident. Positioning around the camera as well. So again, do as I say, not as I do. I sit in front of a window, which means that the light reflection on me is awful. So I look like a ghost. So if you can find somewhere where you get a better light reflection or invest in one of the ring lights, if you're gonna be doing a lot of it online, that's really worthwhile to do. Think about your tone of voice as well. So how are you projecting? If you are standing in a massive room, you're obviously gonna be projecting very differently to if you are in a very small space one-on-one. -on -one. But you still need to consider what that projection looks and feels like. Where are you pausing? So pauses can be really impactful. You can make significant impact with what you're saying when you slow things down. And also when you leave time for people to think. And that's a really long time. So I'm gonna to count to three in silence and you're gonna get very uncomfortable. Now in this world, we think that somebody's frozen on the screen. So we've got to be a little bit careful of how we use those silences in the virtual space. But they are really important. If we're trying to emphasize a point, then we don't have to always be speaking at speed. And quite often when we're nervous, what we do is we speed up. And almost everybody gets nervous when they present. So anybody who says they don't has had a lot of practice or is lying. 
<laughs> almost everybody has some sense of nerves or anxiety before they get up in front of you. And we speed up because we're trying to cram everything in back to this, this concept of talking about everything. If we go back to one idea, one simple idea, I'm not trying to tell you my entire life story. I'm trying to tell you three key moments from my life that represent one idea. And that's a lot easier to do than trying to fit the chronology of an entire life story into a presentation. We also need to think about what we look like, whether that's on screen or face to face, how we dress, how we match in the ambience of the event or the audience that we're with, what are the expectations, how do we want to come across and think professional. So sometimes our audience is going to want us to have a laugh and a joke with them. And sometimes they are going to want us to be deathly serious. So I'm making sure that we're matching that mood. Contingency planning and technology. Yasmin, I don't know whether you want to jump in on this one. <laughs> I think we've probably all had experience with this at some point where you go somewhere to present something and the USB stick isn't recognised or something isn't working, the projector isn't working, um, the computer isn't working, something isn't working. So contingency planning, what's your backup plan? How are you going to ensure that things can still happen? I think we talked before about um, not relying on the slides, but making sure that whatever you do say is simply supported by the slides um, and still being able to, to present. I've been in situations where I've delivered workshops for students um, and for whatever reason, the computer in the room wasn't letting me log in or whatever. So I always brought a copy of the structure of the presentation or the workshop with me and then just ended up winging it with the students in the room because you just never know what's going to get, what's going to happen. Something is likely to break because we are relate, uh, relying on machines um, to do some of the work for us. So I think contingency planning is, is really, really crucial. And we've said this a number of times now, what happens when we ditch the slides, we end up with some of the most powerful public speaking moments in human history. So again, these are just some links you can go away and have a look at, but these are really powerful presentations. If you look for commencement addresses, so this is in the US when um, students are going for graduation and they might have high profile speakers come in and talk about what those students can go on and do with their lives. These are inspirational and they do not have slides. There is no supporting material to go with it. It's all about the content and the delivery. Um, the I have a dream speech. So just some suggestions of content to have a look at when we take the slides away. So the last bit we're gonna do for this session is just introduce you to a concept that we use with some of our students. Now this is based on Pine and Gilmore who came up with the concept of the experience economy. So we've had the agrarian economy, the farming economy, we've had the um, transactional economy, we are into the experience economy, service economy, experience economy. We might even be in subscription economy, depending on your reading. And some people are arguing we're in the purpose economy now, but the experience economy is this idea that we are buying experiences. So from a customer service perspective, we are not buying the product or the thing, we're buying the experience and the way that it makes us feel. So because we are trying to get that memorable experience, that, that thing that we buy into, back to this concept of storytelling, we can then apply that experience, that experiential thought process to delivering a presentation or a pitch. So there are four E's within Pine and Gilmore's experience um, kind of economy model. And then we add a fifth here at Aston University as well. So these four methods, we, we need to entertain we want people to feel entertained and that means they're sitting back so they're passive but they're absorbed in what we're telling them so this is when there's a really great netflix mini series on or we're watching a film we 
are fully absorbed in the experience. We forget that we're in the cinema or that we're sitting in our living room. We're enjoying the moment. We've got that fantastic appreciation for what's going on around us. We are fully entertained. But we also need some form of education. And that education is a bit more active. So we're actively involved in the experience now. So I don't know who watches Richard Osman's House of Games or Pointless or Countdown or any of these quiz shows. They're great for keeping your brain active, but they're also great for getting you shouting at the TV when somebody does not answer a question that is so straightforward that they really should be able to answer that question. That's the educational side. We are learning something from the process. And when it comes to pitches or presentations, we can educate by including quizzes, by asking questions, by saying, did you know that? So we're thinking about how do we ensure that our audience is learning something from this experience? So they're entertained by this experience, they're learning something from this experience. We might even be able to get that sense of escapism. So that escapism, we are fully involving the audience in the experience. Now we're not doing that with you today, but we could be getting you to role play. Everybody hates the phrase role play, right? But role play is one way in which we create that sense of escapism. When we're pitching or presenting, and I've seen, again, we've seen some really fantastic examples of this through initiatives like the Aston Business Clinic and the Global Business Challenge that Aston University is involved in. Students might act out the roles of a weather presenter. So they are the weather presenter and they're pointing out the different elements for the client pitch are the different parts of the country and the different weather icons. They might be acting as TV presenters. So they're holding up their microphone and their microphone is their hairbrush because they're sat at home and what else have they got to hand? But you feel that sense of escapism. You really feel that they're handing, and now I'm handing over to the studio and somebody else picks up the microphone and they are in the studio. So how do we create that sense of escapism where we feel as if we're on that journey? And we can do it through telling stories as well. So quite often with startups, you'll hear the founder story. So they will tell you how they came up with that idea in the first place, where that passion came from in order to solve the problem that they've identified. And they'll tell you about the, ro the roadblocks they hit on the way, the obstacles, and you will feel the pain when they tell you that they nearly lost their house because the business didn't get off the ground as quickly as they expected and they owed some money. And then when they stood in front of the investment panel and they'd forgotten their slides and the product that they would brought had melted in the car on the way there, but they managed to overcome that and they've now got the investment to be able to move forward. You feel that experience, you feel like you're on the journey with them, you escape into that, that realm, that story with them. And then the aesthetic. So yes, aesthetic begins with an A, but we're talking about the four E's here, so we'll give it an E for the purpose of this. So aesthetic, we, we're talking about the senses. So what you see, what you hear, what you smell, what you taste, what you feel. And again, that's harder to do in the virtual world, but not impossible. So you could all have the same virtual background. So if you are pitching, then four of you pitching on the screen, you all have the same virtual background. That creates a sense of togetherness. You might use imagery, slides, PowerPoints, prezzies, videos. So you might use these different visual media. You could send gift boxes in advance. So Yasmin's just done a conference where they had some fantastic goodies beforehand and afterwards. I was very jealous. Yeah, it was really good. They sent, um, so about a week before the, it wasn't really a conference, it was like a three day workshop. Um, they sent a box with um, a notebook, some post-its, a little succulent plant, a mug, a pen. And then after the workshop, there was a celebration event about a week later. So they sent a little Prosecco and a, an actual glass flute, not just a plastic one, a proper glass flute in a box as well. So that was quite, quite snazzy, but we don't all have the budget to do that sort of thing, sadly. 
definitely not but you can create you can bring those senses to life you could ask everybody to make a cup of coffee before they join the call and then you can talk about the smell of freshly brewed coffee and people have got the aroma in the room with them yeah so it's how do you create that sense of aesthetic how do you bring that to life and you can do that through sound through sight through touch through smell and you can do it through description so you don't necessarily have to create the smell we we know that supermarkets have the smell of freshly baked bread to enable us to feel starving and buy bread and everything else when we're in the supermarket you don't have to have that smell you can talk about that smell talk about the bed, bread baking talk about how the crunch of the crust when it breaks and now you're all hungry and want to go and have lunch so we will wrap it up here the fifth e that dr eleanor vitreno who's one of our colleagues here at aston has added to this is around team spirit so this is particularly relevant when you are presenting as a group of people rather than as an individual what do you do to ensure that you come across as a collective and not as five people who've individually rehearsed your own bits of the presentation and not had time to see what anybody else is saying? So that is how do you look like a team? How do you present like a team? How do you manage the transitions and the handovers between each other so that you come across as a coherent group of people rather than an individual? So if you're putting together a pitch or a presentation then those are the five E's that you can go through as a checklist. Now we were gonna make you do some pitches on camera, but we are running out of time. So you get away with not having to pitch to your colleagues on camera, but go away and practice these skills. Please do try them out. Let us know what you think. And in summary, journey. So we said take one big thing away from that and that is the one big idea. If you can hold more than one big thing in your mind and you can hold three, then let's go with the framing, the context, the journey. What is the story that you are telling? What's the context of this picture or this presentation? Depth, not breadth. So focus on that one big idea. Go deep rather than going broad. And memorize, don't read. So either ad lib, or put the effort in to memorize. What you don't wanna do is get stuck in that valley of awkwardness where you've started to memorize, but then you forget halfway through and you haven't got the note cards to help see you through it. So either focus on ad-libbing or focus on memorizing. But if you're gonna put the time into memorizing, then really put the time in. And there's a really interesting article, it's from 2013, so it's quite a long time ago, but it talks about how to give that killer presentation based on TED. And the other thing, we have got some other links in the slides that we will share with you as well. So thank you so much for joining us on what is one of the hottest days of the year and incredibly sticky and uncomfortable. It's been a real pleasure having you joining us on camera and taking part. We would have um, made you do some group exercises, but firstly, it is quite hot. And secondly, it is only a short session. But if you have got any questions or there's anything that you want to ask us, we're happy to stick around for another five minutes and take that. Otherwise, feel free to go and enjoy your lunch breaks. Thank you, everyone.